everybody, this is Mr. Nixon. Um, wanted to go through with those videos that I was posting about Monday night. And I want to talk about the respiratory system and I want to talk about the digestive system. And I won't do both of them on the same video. Um, I, I want to do a couple of videos on respiratory and a couple of videos on digestive. And we'll just see just how long it takes for me to kind of talk through this. Now, for respiratory, um, when I look at, at the lecture test that's going to be coming up, uh, the lecture test is broken into three parts. There's respiratory, there's digestive, and then metabolism. And the test is, I think it's like 70-something questions, and it's broken up um, almost even. Um, the majority of the questions are coming from respiratory and digestive, and then there's a, there's a, a, a small section of questions, uh, well, like about 15 or so, questions from m metabolism. And maybe I can make like a topic list and send you guys to try to kind of narrow the focus on what you need to know. But as far as respiratory is concerned, there is a, out of the, I put 25 questions on this test that are straight from the respiratory system. Out of those 25, the majority of them are talking about respiration and how you breathe and gas laws and things like that. There are some others. I'll send you a, a topic list. There are some questions that ask. They're kind of like definition questions. You can memorize that stuff. But the thing that gets students the most on this test for respiratory is not knowing this. This is that um, at the very end of the chapter, the respiratory chapter, there's this big ugly picture that takes up like what seems like the whole book. <laughs> and it looks like this. And essentially it has eight parts, um, eight steps to the process of respiration. And it starts with how you get air in and then the separation of oxygen from that air uh, as it crosses from the alveoli into the uh, pulmonary capillaries, then how it binds the hemoglobin and red blood cells and that it's then carried to the systemic capillaries where the systemic capillaries, the, the oxygen diffuses out of the systemic capillaries and into the tissues then those tissues then use that oxygen and create carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide then diffuses into the bloodstream where it then has the chance of being transported by three different ways, um, one of which is being bound to hemoglobin. Uh, another is just, the, you know, it's soluble in water, so just floating around in the blood plasma, and then it can also uh, ultimately be convert, converted to bicarbonate ions and the hydrogen ion, extra hydrogen ion binds to the hemoglobin while the bicarbonate ions float around in the plasma, which is all going back to the lungs where that carbon dioxide then uh, diffuses out of the blood and into the alveoli and then you exhale. This happy little process, you need to understand how this works because I'm going to ask questions about partial pressure and Boyle's law and Henry's law and Dalton's law, and they're not real deep questions. If you understand that, that, that sheet, then the questions are not that deep. If you are trying to memorize that sheet and not really understand it, that can be kind of a no-no. So let me kind of talk you through what I just showed you and break it down in the layman terms and maybe that'll help you understand then when you go to memorize some stuff you've got some understanding to back it and you'll knock these questions out and we can make this rebound for the next several tests for july here's how this thing works um first thing first i need to breathe because the cells of my body require oxygen hands down if i don't have oxygen then that's going to really suck because then my cells they won't be able to produce enough ATP to keep living, to keep growing, to keep doing what they need to do. And so then my cells will die. And then if my cells die, my tissues die, then my organs die, then my organ systems fail, and then I fail. And then it's game over. And I don't want that. So I have to get oxygen to them. The problem is that oxygen is in a mixture of gases called air. This is the atmosphere all around me. And the atmosphere around me, this air, contains a, a, a number of different gases all in it. So in order to get to the oxygen in the air, I'm going to have to just bring in air as a whole and then separate oxygen from the air later. All right? 
So, um, you know, I can't sit around and do this number. Oh, look, there's some, there's some oxygen, in the, and then to take the oxygen, instead it's going to look like you, it's something else, all right? So I'm taking in air so I can get to the oxygen. Now, to get air to move into me, that's quite the task. So I'm going to use a gas law to get air to move into me. I'm going to use Boyle's law. And the reason why I'm going to use Boyle's law first is because there's another rule about gases. And that rule is that pressure gradients are applied to gases. In other words, gases will always move from a high pressure system to a low pressure system. And, and when gases move from a high pressure system to a low pressure system, it moves down a pressure gradient. Now, you'll notice that when they grade a parking lot, the, what they're doing when they grade a parking lot is they're making sure that that parking lot is not only level, but they're making sure that there's a slight slope to it. And the reason why is so that when it rains, the water will run off of the parking lot versus flood a parking lot. The first time they built uh, a parking lot over at the Benson campus, the guys who built it didn't grade it. And so there was this huge rainstorm that came through. It like rained for like three days straight. That whole parking lot was a lake because they didn't grade it. And so they had to come back through after all the water finally evaporated, which took days. And they had to redo the entire parking lot all over again. Why? Because they had to grade it and put a slight slope to it so that when water was running on the parking lot, it would run off of the parking lot and into the uh, re re retention pond. So um, that's very important for gases as well. You can, If you sit at the top of a hill on a bike, your bike is going to roll down the hill. It's a gradient. There's a high end and there's a low end and you and your bike will roll from the high end of the hill to the low end of the hill. That's what pressure does with gases. If you have a high pressure system of gas, that gas will want to move somewhere where there's lower, a lower pressure system. That's why when you watch the news and you're looking at the weather, in the weather they always show high pressure systems moving towards the east. It's always moving towards the east. Why? Because the high pressure system starts up there around northwest and then it moves down to the southeast where there's a lower pressure system. Same thing happens with gases in the air. The air around me right now, the atmospheric pressure, the atmospheric pressure of air around me is higher. I can make it, if I make it, if the atmospheric pressure around me is constant, it's here. All right? 760 millimeters mercury. The atmospheric pressure of air is here. If I want the air in the atmosphere to move from where it is around me, I just need to create one space where the pressure of air is here. It doesn't even have to be that low. I just need to get it just a little lower than atmospheric pressure. Because what's going to happen is, here's atmospheric pressure, here's the pressure in this new container that I've just created air is going to move from the atmosphere and into that container because the pressure in that container is less than the atmospheric pressure out here. Air will always travel from a high pressure system to a low pressure system. That's where Boyle's Law comes into play. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make the space inside of me a lower air pressure than the pressure of air around me, therefore forcing air from out of the atmosphere around me to go inside of me. Um, some people don't believe that. They're like, yeah, whatever, that's, that's nice, Julian, but I don't believe that that's going to happen. Okay, then take a balloon. If you blow up a balloon and then you open the mouth of the balloon, air will jump into your balloon. It's not going to happen. Um, what's going to actually happen is the air in the balloon is going to escape from the balloon. That's what's going to happen. And the reason for that is because the air in
In other words, when one goes up, the other one goes down. That's what it means to have an inverse relationship. So if the volume of an area increases, then the amount of pressure of air inside that thing decreases. If the volume, uh, then the pressure of air inside of that thing will increase. That's just, that's how it works. So all I got to do is make the volume inside of my, all I got to do is make the internal volume increase, which makes the pressure of air within me decrease, which therefore makes that pressure a little lower than the atmospheric pressure of air around me, therefore allowing air to make its way from the atmosphere into me. That's why Boyle's Law is so important. And that's why uh, respiratory muscles are so important. That's why it's important to understand how the diaphragm works and the intercostal muscles work. Because your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles, they directly affect the volume within your chest. And so the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, they can increase the volume of your chest. And when they increase the volume of your chest, then... Uh, the uh, pressure, sorry, uh, a message popped up and that just threw my attention. I was, rabbit, you know. Um, <laughs> so the volume inside my chest, it increases because of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. And because the volume goes up, the pressure of air goes down. Remember Boyle's Law. It's an inverse relationship. Um, the volume inside my chest, it increases. The pressure of air inside goes down. Therefore, that pressure is a little lower than the pressure of the atmospheric pressure of air around me. So air makes its way into my lungs and then it gets down to my alveoli. Well, cool. But here's the problem now. Um, we've got air in, but we don't need air. We need oxygen, which is in the air. That's kind of like going fishing with a giant bucket and you just capture a whole bunch of seawater and what you want in the seawater is that sea bass that's that's what you really want you want the sea bass that's in the water um you you want whatever you've been out there fishing for in the water problem is there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there too and uh you can't select out of that bucket out of that barrel what you really want until you take the barrel out of the water and put it in the boat and in that case, the, uh, the barrel being in the boat where you can be selective about what you want is the same as the air being in your alveoli. So when the air gets into the alveoli, now you can specifically select what gas you want from the air. And that gas that you want, of course, is oxygen. And in order to get oxygen out of air, you have to understand Dalton's Law. Because Dalton's law states that atmospheric pressure is actually the sum total of all the partial pressure of the gases that are in it. In other words, in this air around us, there's lots of different gases. There's oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, carbon, uh, water vapor. There's all these gases floating around in, in the air. I don't even remember what alien movie it was, but there was some alien movie where aliens came to Earth and they were just like... Um, putting the rock bottom on us i mean you know it was terrible tables ladders chairs matched to to the humans and we were losing and then at, by the end of the movie we lost and the aliens came out of their ships to celebrate it and it was because the aliens uh failed to calculate taking the calculation that um percent of our air is nitrogen and nitrogen was poisonous to them so they started dying that was kind of the end of the movie so you know there's only a small percentage of our air that's actually oxygen and we need that. So oxygen is like, I can't remember, I think it's like 21% of our, there's a small percentage of our air that's oxygen. And each one of those gases that I named, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon, nitrogen, water vapor, all those dudes, they each have their own pressure because each is a gas. So each ga a gas is exhibiting pressure. It's always exhibiting pressure. You don't feel it right now. Like, you're feeling the pressure of having to learn all this crap. But, you know, but you're not the gases around you. Um, however, you can see that gases emit a type of pressure when you take gas and you put it in a container. It exhibits a specific pressure. And so 
oxygen has a pressure. Carbon uh, dioxide has pressure. Carbon monoxide has a pressure. Water vapor has a pressure. And each of these individual pressures that they exhibit in air is known as a partial pressure because it is a part of atmospheric pressure. Therefore, we call it partial pressure. The cool thing about this is that because each gas in the air has its own partial pressure, its pressure that happens to be a part of atmospheric pressure, if we do the right things, we can actually uh, we can actually watch gases follow the pressure gradient principle. Remember pressure gradient. Pressure gradient says gases in air at a higher pressure will always move to a location of lower pressure. So at this moment, when the air gets into your alveoli, the higher partial pressure of oxygen happens to be in your alveoli. The much lower partial pressure of oxygen happens to be in the blood that's traveling through the pulmonary capillaries, which are literally running side by side with the alveoli. Guess what's going to happen? The oxygen is naturally going to follow diffusion, and it's going to diffuse out of the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. Now, fair warning. Uh, when understanding this stuff, I would personally write this stuff down. I, I would draw a little schematic shut. I'd print this thing out and I'd draw all over it and write little notes and stuff because this stuff's kind of in my head now because I talk about it every semester. But when I was first learning this stuff, they didn't have this poster. Uh, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth and I, we practically lived in Jurassic Park and we had chisels and little clay tablets, I was chiseling pictures of this stuff so I could learn it. Now you got this picture, so you can go and you can run off a copy because as you can see, this is nothing more than a black and white copy of that actual picture and draw on it until you can conceptualize what's going on. You want to write down the direction of oxygen and where it's going so you can remember this stuff. So oxygen is now moving out of the air in the alveoli and into the blood of the pulmonary capillaries. That's important to remember. So oxygen is moving out of the air in the, in the alveoli crossing that membrane, that respiratory membrane, and going into the blood of the capillaries. Bet. So now that the oxygen is in the blood, it's all good, right? No, that's where Henry's Law kicks in. Because Henry's Law states that as long as you meet the following three uh, things, you can pretty much force a gas into a liquid. That gas has got to be soluble in that liquid. You've got to have a certain temperature, and you've got to meet the partial pressure requirement. Pressure, temperature, solubility. Those three things. Pressure, temperature, solubility. You got those three, you can force a gas into a liquid. Know why that's important? You wouldn't have soda without it. Because we force carbon dioxide into millions of liters of soda every day. Probably more than millions, the way that the earth consumes soda. But uh, we figured out that Henry's Law would allow us to make Coca-Cola. That's essentially how we wound up making soda. We could force a gas into a liquid. Oxygen is not very soluble in water, and your blood plasma um, is 92% water, so we got a problem. That oxygen is going to diffuse into your blood, but it's going to come right back out of your blood because he's not very soluble. So what winds up happening is when the oxygen diffuses into your blood, it actually gets stuck binding to the hemoglobin of the red blood cells in your blood. And the iron in hemoglobin is like duct tape. It kind of duct tapes the oxygen to the hemoglobin that says, you ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. Um, we can't be stopped now. It's bad boys for life. All right, so it gets stuck and bound to the hemoglobin. It, it ain't going nowhere. Um, and one interesting thing about protein uh, which is what hemoglobin is, is that when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it changes the physical conformation of the hemoglobin, and its shape changes just enough to make it easier for the next molecule of hemoglobin, uh, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. Uh, the oxygen then binds to the hemoglobin. Red blood cells carry it to the capillaries and the tissues. The oxygen then diffuses, because the partial pressure of oxygen in the Systemic capillaries is higher than it is to the tissues. 